Hi, in this video we're going to continue our study of energy in organisms and we're going to look at the specific method of obtaining energy and utilizing energy and unlocking energy for living things. Remember that life requires a highly ordered system. Uh, that means that you, there has to be an input of energy. Order is maintained in living things by having a constant energy input. That The energy input has to exceed the free energy that's lost to disorder so that an organism can power all of the cellular processes that it needs to as a part of its overall metabolism. Reactions that are exergonic, for instance, taking a molecule such as ATP and breaking it down into ADP is an exergonic reaction where energy is given off. Well, the reason that that's favorable for living things is that that energy can be used to maintain or even increase order in a living system. Therefore, all of those cellular processes can be energized. So what is ATP? ATP is the energy currency. That's a kind of a catchphrase in biology. It is the energy that is used by all cells. It is chemical energy, which means it's just a molecule that's available to do work. It is the free energy that we keep talking about. Um, use the example of, of trading money and speaking of currencies, trading money. It's a lot easier to go to the grocery store and trade money, a currency that everyone is aware of and used to, rather than going to Cub Foods and saying, hey, you know, I can build you a deck if you can just give me some food. So speaking of currency, this ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate, is a molecule with high energy bonds that can really be traded for doing work of the cell. So here we have a chemical structure of ATP. It has an adenine base. Oh, look at that little functional group right there. Um, attached to or bonded to ribose. Remember, ribose is a sugar. And the three phosphates. For ATP, the energy phosphates, the three phosphates here, are really the highlight of the molecule. Because in these bonds between the individual phosphates is stored relatively a lot of potential energy. Well, it may not be as exciting to think about what ATP can do for you as it is to think about what a $5, $10, $20 bill can do for you. But ATP is that energy currency to get things done with living things. All of the energetic things you do, from running and jumping and shooting a jump shot or throwing a pass, to birds flying and even thinking processes, messages that are sent in the body, um, things that require cellular energy like active transport, something we'll talk about in the future, um, just cellular movements, and any anabolic building up synthesis process. Remember, to go from a state of lower energy to higher energy, there has to be an energy input. And that energy input is ATP. I shouldn't go any further than just reminding you and getting this in your brain that this organism right here, even though it's a plant, and yes, it does make carbon compounds in a process that's energized by the sun, plants and other autotrophs absolutely have cellular work that they need to, to do also. So even plants need ATP. So again, how do we get energy from ATP? By breaking the high energy bond that holds a ton of potential energy in the phosphate bonds as a part of the triphosphate tail of ATP. Remember that this process 
is really a hydrolysis process. It is an addition of water to break a high energy bond and off of that ATP, the energy that is able to be harvested is free energy. Remember that that energy then is able to do work of the cell. Of course, this process is only going to occur with the help of enzymes. And two of them at play here are ATP synthase and ATPase. Now, those sound a lot alike, but I think by the, um, the title of one that you can keep them straight as to what their job is. But this cycle of ATP being broken down into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is going to release energy. That energy can then be used by the cell for endergonic reactions. So for re energy requiring processes, we can break down ATP and use that energy. Then exergonic reactions in the cells are then able to build, use energy to build ATP again. So there's the cycle from adenosine triphosphate broken down into adenosine diphosphate, and then that is used to synthesize, again, ATP. So we can look at both of these processes, and I don't want these to be, these to be confusing. Breaking down ATP into ADP is indeed an exergonic reaction. That energy can then be used to power endergonic reactions of the cell. The buildup or synthesis from ADP and a phosphate to ATP, that is indeed an endergonic reaction. That energy comes from exergonic processes in the cell. So as we've stated, this is a reversible reaction. Adenosine diphosphate plus an inorganic phosphate can yield more ATP. ATP can then be digested or broken down into ADP and its phosphate. So remember, this is going to release energy. This takes energy. So this is an extremely important diagram or visual to understand. The ATP-ADP cycle the adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate cycle. In synthesizing ATP from the reactants ADP and inorganic phosphate, this process takes energy. Where does that energy come from? Other exergonic reactions in the body or in the cell. In order to break down ATP, that's an exergonic reaction that releases energy. That energy can be used to power the cellular processes that take energy. So in other words, energy that's released by the hydrolysis of ATP is harvested and used by the cell to power cell processes. Then in turn, the products that are left over can then be, become the reactants in a coupled reaction. But the only way to synthesize ATP again is to put energy in. Well, where does that energy come from? The same exergonic reactions that we've been talking about. So where does this actually come from? Where is and when is ATP actually made in the body? It's made in this process we've talked about, I've mentioned already, called cellular respiration. And really what that is in its most simple form is taking the food that you eat, adding in oxygen, and then yielding 
a lot of free energy. A little bit more specifically, what this, what this involves is taking the glucose from the food that we eat and the oxygen from what we breathe in and through this cellular process or pathway called cellular respiration, we make ATP molecules. And of course, this whole cycle starts over because when we split an ATP molecule, of course, we're going to release a lot of energy that the cells can use. Cellular respiration is a, in such an important process. It is a process that not only animals use. You need to know that plants and other autotrophs definitely utilize cellular respiration. Just because they can also use photosynthesis doesn't mean that they don't have their own cellular processes that need to be powered. So that's kind of a, kind of a common myth or misunderstanding out in the general public is that plants power everything they need by the light. And that's just not true. Using light, plants are able to make carbon compounds like glucose that we'll get to later on, but they also need to utilize cellular respiration. So that includes the requirement of oxygen, and that produces, or excuse me, along with the food that is eaten, the glucose from the food, that glucose is what's called oxidized, and the oxygen that we use is actually reduced. So these are coupled reactions, which means they're kind of, they go together. It's an endergonic and an exogonic kind of reaction that we talked about before, but it's an oxidation reduction reaction. The breakdown of one glucose molecule, one six carbon molecule can result in ideally somewhere between 36 and 38 ATP molecules. And from what you just learned, ATP molecules, just breaking off a phosphate, can release a lot of free energy for the cell to do work. In fact, even though the change in G gives free energy for this would be negative, indicating that the digestion of ATP or the hydrolysis of ATP is exergonic, it's about 7.3 kcals of energy per ATP molecule. So all of that adds up fast from one glucose molecule. And all of that adds up fast when you think of the huge number of cellular respiration processes or pathways that are going on in the body, in all cells. So we'll get more to that down the road. So this is basically the overall equation for cellular respiration. And again, just as we said before, the glucose from the food that you eat plus the oxygen that you obviously breathe in through a complex chemical pathway is going to yield all of these products. Carbon dioxide, water, of course electrons that we'll get to a little bit later, and then some ATP molecules that can then be used to release free energy. Again, our next stop is to look at cellular respiration in more detail and for us to break down the steps that actually uh, will produce ATP molecules so that the cells can then energize all of their own cell processes.